Keith Baz quits as chair of the Home Affairs Select Committee. The Labour MP has resigned over newspaper allegations about prostitutes, saying those who hold others to account must themselves be accountable. Also this lunchtime, the hate preacher Anjum Chowdhury is jailed for five years for drumming up support for Islamic State. Sports Direct scraps zero hours contracts, but not for all of its workers. And a major security breach at a London airport as protesters stop flights by getting onto the runway. This is the ITV Lunchtime News with Nina Hussain. Good afternoon. The Labour MP Keith Vaz has resigned as chair of the Home Affairs Select Committee. It follows allegations in the papers over the weekend that he paid for prostitutes and offered to buy them drugs. The Leicestershire politician said those who hold others to account must themselves be accountable. Our political correspondent Carl Dinnan has the latest. He is one of the great survivors of modern politics, but today Keith Vaz reached the end of the road as chairman of the influential Home Affairs Select Committee and one of the government's chief tormentors. A third day of lurid headlines about his private life and allegations that he had paid male escorts for sex has led to his resignation. A short time ago in a statement he said it is in the best interests of the Home Affairs Select Committee that its important work can be conducted without any distractions whatsoever. I am genuinely sorry that recent events make it impossible for this to happen if I remain chair. The integrity of the Select Committee system matters to me. Those who hold others to account must themselves be accountable. His political opponents had been pushing for him to go. And to uh, Sir Bernard Hogan Howe, the head of the Metropolitan Police, um, asking for an investigation. Mr Vaz was due to face his fellow committee members in closed session at two o'clock this afternoon. It was expected that if he hadn't resigned by then, they would have had a vote of no confidence in him. It had appeared that he might try to involved, tough it out, even appearing in the House of Commons yesterday. Mr Keith Vaz. Thank you, Mr yeah. Speaker. Could I warmly welcome the Home Secretary to her post, and I hope she has a long and successful term as Home Secretary. But by this morning, the pressure had become too much. And so ends this chapter in the colourful career of one of Parliament's most notable characters. For the time being at least, Keith Vaz has bounced back from disgrace before. This time, in the end, after three days of headlines, was his resignation inevitable? Well, I'm not sure that he necessarily thought that it was. As I said, he has bounced back from these things before. He had to resign as a minister uh, once uh, over a, a different kind of affair. So I'm not sure he thought so, but it was becoming clear that members of his committee had lost confidence. And if they had held a vote of no confidence, it would have been very difficult uh, for him to stay on. Despite the fact, I mean, you just about heard Andrew Bridge in the Tory MP there saying he was referring this to the police. It's not entirely clear that a, a, a criminal offence has being uh, committed here. What happens next is that uh, the uh, Tory, Tim Lawton, will probably take over the chair of this committee in the meantime, uh, and then the House of Commons will vote for a new chairman. It'll probably be a, a Labour MP. It's, uh, it's their, their committee to chair uh, at the moment. Carl Dinan, thank you. In the past few minutes, the hate preacher Anjum Chowdhury has been jailed for five years and six months for drumming up support for the group that calls itself Islamic State. Chowdhury has been convicted of using online lectures and messages to encourage support for the banned group. The judge at the Old Bailey said he'd shown contempt for the democracy in which he lived, but had little remorse. Martha Fairley reports. This man. For 20 years, radical cleric Anjum Chowdhury managed to stay on the right side of the law. But he is no longer free to preach his messages of hate, sentenced at the Old Bailey to five and a half years in prison for inviting support for the so-called Islamic State. The 49-year-old was a leading figure in the banned group al Muhajirun, courting controversy with his views on Sharia law. But it wasn't until he posted a series of talks on YouTube promoting support for the so-called Islamic State that police could move in to arrest him. Antem Chowdhury's been very careful to walk a line where he didn't cross over into offences 
until recently, until we prescribed Daesh or the Home Secretary prescribed Daesh as a terrorist organisation. What's very clear is that he has been um, encouraging others to join a terrorist organisation that commits atrocities and really we're very pleased that we've been able to prosecute and successfully so. His supporters included the killers of Fusilier Lee Rigby and he used social media as well as public demonstrations to build up a following of thousands, making him a prolific recruiter responsible for radicalising many young Muslims. Whether he's an oppressor... As his sentencing hearing began today, his lawyer said in mitigation that Anjum Chowdhury had had time to reflect and on reflection would have done things differently had he known the boundaries of the law. But for their pledge of allegiance to the proclaimed Islamic Caliphate state, Chowdhury and his co-accused Misanur Rahman were each jailed for five years and six months, finally silencing the voice of one of Britain's most radical hate preachers. Martha Fairley, ITV News. Our correspondent Juliette Bremner was in court for that verdict. What's been the reaction to the sentence? Well, the reaction to the sentence in court from a handful of supporters, um, Chowdhury's acolytes, you might call them, was to stand up and shout Allah U Akbar. But they were ushered very quickly out of court once they'd done that. He didn't make much response at all himself. He was just led away down to start his sentence. But I think it's important to point out that this might seem to be a rather lenient sentence, but in fact, it's Terrorism Act, but Section 12 of the Terrorism Act and relatively minor offences. The public might be surprised by that, but the, in the public perception, he's seen as a vile and repugnant man whose words are often outrageous. But that doesn't mean that he's actually crossed any boundaries until now, when he has been found guilty of inviting support for so-called Islamic State. And the judge made it clear that far from condemning, as he would have expected him to, he actually helped to warp impressionable young minds. He clearly saw that as a danger as he sent him down to start his five years, six months. Juliet Bremner, thank you. In June, the boss of Sports Direct promised change. Today, we saw it. After reviewing working practices at the company, all staff will now be paid above the minimum wage and the company will scrap zero-hour contracts for its retail staff. But in its warehouse, likened by MPs to a Victorian workhouse, the controversial contracts will stay. Peter Smith has the details. You heard it here first. Sports Direct has a sale on. And it is an especially fitting offer today because Mike Ashley's company has just pledged guaranteed hours to the 80% of its staff currently working on zero hours contracts. Well, this is definitely a step in the right direction. I think if I was one of the 18,200 workers in retail right now, I'd be pretty pleased that no longer when I was I going to have to suffer the indignity of zero hours contracts. This switch in policy is part of a wholesale review by the company initiated after an undercover investigation exposed disturbing treatment of employees at the company's Shirebrook warehouse. Jackets and vests, guys. Salaries were docked for being just a minute late and workers were threatened with the sack for things like excessive chatting or long toilet breaks. Then Mr Ashley admitted in front of MPs that Sports Direct had broken the law. Do you accept that the company was effectively paying workers below the minimum wage? Uh, on that specific point, for that specific bit of time, yes. It is the workers at Sports Direct's retail outlets, shops like this one, who will benefit. They'll be offered guaranteed 12 hours work each week as opposed to zero hours contracts. But those benefits will not extend to the majority of workers at Sports Direct's infamous Shirebrook warehouse. That's because most of them are employed by agencies and brought in by Sports Direct, so they are not eligible. But Sports Direct has pledged an end to policies that put warehouse workers in fear of losing their jobs. To employ a full-time nurse and welfare officer at Shirebrook, a confidential system for reporting sexual harassment and fewer searches of warehouse staff. The Sports Direct share price has already gone up since these reforms were announced and with the AGM tomorrow, it might just be enough to buy Mr Ashley time with disgruntled unions and, crucially, his shareholders. Peter Smith, ITV News, Glasgow.
Our business editor, Joel Hills, is here. He's facing those shareholders tomorrow, Mike Ashley. How will they react? Yeah, it's the company's annual general meeting, that time where the owners uh, of the company and the board come face to face and shareholders tend to tell the board exactly what they think. And tomorrow there'll be another frank and I imagine pretty fiery exchange of views. There is no question, now Mike Ashley owns 55% of the business. The rest of it is owned by companies like Standard Life, Legal and General, the sorts of companies that invest in many cases are pension savings on our behalf. Mm. They're not happy for a number of reasons. They don't like all the headlines about this company exploiting its staff. They don't like the fact that the share price, the performance of the company, has collapsed in the last 12 months. The company's fallen out of the FTSE. Uh, but they really don't like the fact that they see the board of this company as being supine. The executives, the chief executive, the chairman, in theory, are supposed to run this company in the interests of shareholders. These shareholders feel it's run in the interest of just one, Mike Ashley, that they defer to his judgment and they see this episode as an example of that. So they will be happy that Sports Direct finally says it's going to be treating its staff with dignity and respect. Quite right too, they'll say. But they think the company, the problems at that company run much deeper. Joel Hills, thank you. A major breach of security at one of the country's national airports caused lengthy delays and cancellations for thousands of passengers today. Nine protesters, claiming to be from the Black Lives Matter movement, managed to get onto the runway at London City Airport early this morning, then staged a sit-in. It took hours before they were removed and arrested. From there, Nick Wallace reports. It should have been business as usual at London City Airport this morning. Instead, it was the site of a blockade by a small group of protesters who successfully stopped all flights from landing or taking off for more than seven hours. The group responsible is Black Lives Matter, an organisation which shut down the Heathrow M4 spur a month ago, aiming to highlight the disadvantages suffered by black people in the UK and around the world. By 2050, there will be 200 million climate refugees, according to the UNHCR. What's that got to do with shutting down an airport? Mm, because when, when we're faced with aviation ex expansion, we're seeing that politicians aren't serious about climate change. And climate, the climate crisis is disproportionately affecting people of colour, black people across the globe. City Airport mainly serves domestic and European destinations. Dozens of flights this morning were cancelled. Passengers turning up at the airport were told to make alternative arrangements. It is very inconvenient and it's quite surprising that um, the airport security couldn't stop them getting on there and then once they're on there, they, I don't understand why they can't remove them. We've been here for quite a few hours. A bit frustrating, but that's about it. The, the organisation is important, but I mean, you know, going extreme, to my opinion, I think is not something that should be acceptable. More concerning is how the protesters were able to get themselves onto the runway and lock themselves in place for so long. We're told Britain faces significant terror threats, yet a group of protesters made a mockery of security at a key part of London's transport infrastructure. And they've said their direct action will continue. Yes, Nick, there must be real concerns now about this security beach there. Yes, flights have started taking off and landing from London City, but right now there is an investigation taking place as to exactly how these protesters were able to saunter onto the eastern end of London City Airport and stay there for so long. There has been a rumour they made it by boat, which would make sense, but that hasn't been confirmed by anyone. At the moment, I would imagine there are some robust discussions which are taking place between the police and the head of security at London City Airport as to exactly what access point these protesters used. Nick Wallace, thank you. Well, passengers at London City aren't the only ones facing disruption today. British Airways has apologised to its passengers after an IT glitch hit check-in systems, causing hours of delays here, across Europe and around the rest of the world. The airline says the problem has now been fixed. Two teenagers have admitted killing a mother and daughter at their home in Lincolnshire. The boy and girl can't be named because of their age. Denied murder in court, but admitted manslaughter. Ben Chapman is at Nottingham Crown Court. Ben, talk us through what's happened in court so far today. 
Well, these two teenagers, a boy and a girl, are both 15 years old and they appeared in the dock together this morning, speaking only to confirm their names and to enter their pleas. And because of their young ages, they were helped by their solicitor as they each in turn said the words, not guilty of murder, but guilty of of manslaughter and in so doing they have admitted killing Elizabeth Edwards a dinner lady and her 13 year old daughter Katie their bodies were discovered at their home in Spalding in Lincolnshire in April the two defendants were both 14 years old at the time of the crime now Katie Edwards father was in court uh, this morning for the hearing he cried in the public gallery as those pleas were entered and because the two teenagers have both pleaded not guilty on the murder charge there will now be a full trial that will take place here next month and both defendants have been remanded in custody until that time. Ben Chapman many thanks. Still to come this lunchtime is Rio ready with the latest from Brazil with 24 hours until the start of the Paralympics. Just a fortnight ago, the head of the Paralympics said that these games were in complete crisis. But thanks to the sports-mad Brazilian people, more than one and a half million tickets have now been sold. But first, the number of violent crimes against women going through the courts in England and Wales is at a record high, up nearly 10% over the last year. In the year leading up to March, there were more than 4,500 prosecutions for rape and more than 2,500 convictions. Prosecutions for sexual offences other than rape jumped to nearly 12,000, the biggest rise ever, year on year of 22.5%. And more than 200 people have been prosecuted under the new revenge porn law. Well, to discuss this, I'm joined by Rachel Chris, who is co-director of a charity called End Violence Against Women, and by Dr. Dr. Anne Oliverius, a solicitor who specialises in representing survivors of sexual abuse and harassment. Thank you both for coming in. If I can start with you, in this situation, we've seen a new law come in. Let's start with the good news. Does it show that this new law on so-called revenge porn is actually working? Well, we've had 200 prosecutions or so uh, under this law. It's a start. Um, it's a very weak law in many respects. It's just a starting law. Mm. You know, you can only get prosecuted if you do revenge pornography with deliberation, if you intend malice. If you do it to have fun or to make money, you can't go to jail Goodness, for that. there's a difference. Oh, yes. When we're talking about revenge porn, we're talking about people who may or may not have taken photographs privately and then somebody for revenge has... has spread them around online and, and this can be in all sorts of situations to friends to family to strangers and, and even to colleagues and bosses absolutely and we are seeing that happening more because the technology is enabling it to happen we're seeing it happen in schools between peers and it's part of a continuum of violence against women it's part of the way men harass women mm. we see it happen in domestic violence cases or where a woman accuses a man of rape so it's good that we've got this legislation in place but it's really only the start of the story. How much should the likes, the, the big guys, the likes of Twitter and Facebook be doing to stop this or is it down to the individual, Dr Oliverius? Oh well, we're working hard with those, you know, uh, social media to try and get changes and they've come a long distance. But of course we'd like them to be responsible legally under the law for posting revenge pornography. They say they don't have the technology, but they do have the technology to stop child pornography. If you can stop child pornography, you can certainly put in means so to stop So the technology revenge. is there. And, and Rachel, before I let you go, we are running out of time, but this headline figure of a 10% rise mm -hmm. against women, violent crime, what is causing that? That's a huge rise. We are seeing an increase in confidence amongst women to report these crimes, but it is very much the tip of the iceberg. Only about 10% of rapes get reported to the police in the first place. And we're seeing a reduction in support services, which is what women really need if they experience this sort of violent crime. OK, Rachel, Chris and Dr Anne Oliverius, thank you very much for coming to speak to me. Thank you. Thank you. John Lewis is creating 500 new jobs with the opening of two new distribution centres in Milton Keynes. The retailer says the expansion is necessary to keep up with online sales with demand for deliveries jumping from 4% to 47% over the past 10 years. 
And in Terry, tennis, Andy Murray has thrashed Bulgarian Grigor Dimitriov to reach the quarterfinals of the US Open. The Brit won 6-1, 6-2, 6-2, -2, and now faces the Japanese player Kei Nishigori in the last eight. Finally, the Paralympic Games start in Rio tomorrow. Exciting for the athletes and the Brits are all raring to go, but time is running out for the organisers who were already struggling to, with cuts to their budgets. So before the Games even begin, there's a race to get everything ready. Richard Palo reports from Rio. Rio is ready again for the second act of its sporting summer. Plenty of last minute preparations. These Paralympics have been scaled back and some venues altered or closed. But all countries are here, invited ones at least. For the British team, beating their London Hall of 120 medals is their bullish aim. You think you can do better than London? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that, that's the target. It's a one-to-one -one target. We're not shying away from that target, but we're also being, I guess, very realistic in terms of standards in Paralympic sport have gone up. And table tennis has a vital part to play if that goal's to be reached and the efforts of our Olympians matched. Oh, there's no pressure, but I think we can do better, man, without the doubt, you know. But uh, Better than the Olympians? Oh, of course, of course. They had the run-up games, we've got the real games. And the stadia will not be the empty arenas that were feared. Many sessions are sold out now. Tickets, a valuable commodity. Just a fortnight ago, the head of the Paralympics said that these games were in complete crisis. But thanks to the sports-mad Brazilian people, more than one and a half million tickets have now been sold. And they're on track to outstrip even Beijing, if not quite London. I think we were very worried. Uh, two but weeks ago, the enforced but alterations together, since really should allow the sport to flourish once again, and so too the athletes. The press conference of two weeks ago was probably the best rocket up the backside ever because it's brought all the parties together. Um, we've brought funding in, we've made some cuts, but we've all worked together as a team, and we're really confident now that we're going to deliver a great games. Given a fair wind, the Paralympics should now become another moment to savour for Brazil. And along with dawn breaking this morning, also comes the realisation of what these venues are set to witness. Richard Palo, ITV News, Rio de Janeiro. And that's all we've got time for so far today. Alastair Stewart and Mary Nightingale will be here with the ITV Evening News. From everyone here for now, bye-bye.